Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, we're gonna talk about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, specifically about aldosterone today. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to begin by first describing to you the diagram that we're gonna be using today. So this part of the diagram are the epithelial cells. So the epithelial cells are the cells that make up the wall of the nephron, and the epithelial cells are gonna be responsible for transporting solutes across the nephron. Now the epithelial cell wall is going to divide two compartments from each other. The first compartment is the tubule lumen, which is the space inside the nephron. And then the second is going to be the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid outside the nephron. Now because of this, we basically have different names for the different sides of the cell. So the membrane that faces the tubule lumen is going to be the apical membrane, and the membrane that faces the interstitial fluid is going to be called the basolateral membrane. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about how aldosterone is going to affect sodium reabsorption. And aldosterone is going to target mainly two regions of the nephron. And the first region that we're gonna look at is the distal convoluted tubule. So how does aldosterone affect sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule? Well, what happens is, is aldosterone is a hormone that is derived from cholesterol. And what aldosterone does is aldosterone passively diffuses through the plasma membrane and binds to the mineral corticoid receptor, which is a receptor inside the cell. And the mineral corticoid receptor is going to bind to aldosterone and exhibit certain effects. So after aldosterone binds to the mineral corticoid receptor, this is going to cause an increase in the transcription of a specific mRNA that codes for the Wnc kinases. So when aldosterone binds to the mineral corticoid receptor, this increases the transcription of mRNA, which therefore increases the translation of specific proteins, and in this case is going to be the WNK kinases. So the WNK kinases are going to have two effects. And the first effect has to do with the implantation of sodium chloride cotransporters in the apical membrane. So WNK kinases are going to increase the implantation of sodium chloride cotransporters into the apical membrane. So in other words, it increases the number of sodium chloride cotransporters in the apical membrane. Now the sodium chloride cotransporters that are implanted into the apical membrane are going to be mainly inactive. So in order to activate these particular cotransporters, we need another protein. And the protein that's going to do this is going to be the SPAC and OSR1 proteins. So the WNK kinases can activate SPAC and OSR1 proteins. And what these particular proteins do is they phosphorylate the inactive sodium chloride cotransporters and activate them. So after these transporters are phosphorylated, they are activated, which then allows them to cotransport sodium and chloride into the cell, therefore increasing sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule. So in short, Aldosterone increases the transcription and translation of specific WNK kinases in the distal convoluted tubule. WNK kinases do two main things in the distal convoluted tubule. First, they increase the implantation of inactive sodium chloride cotransporters into the apical membrane. And secondly, they increase the activity of SPAC and OSR1 proteins which increase the phosphorylation of sodium chloride cotransporters, therefore increasing their activity. So this is going to be how aldosterone increases sodium reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubule. So the second region where aldosterone is going to exhibit its, its effects is going to be in the collecting ducts of the nephron. So how does aldosterone ex exert its effects in the collecting ducts? Well, aldosterone is going to passively diffuse into the cell and bind to the mineral corticoid receptor. The mineral corticoid receptor will then translocate into the nucleus where it will increase the transcription of a specific mRNA, SGK1 mRNA. So SGK1 mRNA will then be translated into the SGK1 protein. And the SGK1 protein has a number of effects. So in order to understand the first effect, we have to talk about another protein in the cell, 
And this protein is NAD42. So NAD42 is going to ubiquinate ENAC channels. So ENAC channels are channels that are present on the apical membrane in the collecting ducts, and the ENAC channels are going to allow sodium to flow down its electrochemical gradient into the cell. And when NAD42 ubiquinates these channels, what happens is, is the ENAC channels, after you, they're ubiquinated, are marked for degradation. So the more ubiquinated ENAC channels we, we have, the more degradation of these channels we have. So NED42 causes the degradation of these channels, which therefore decreases the number of these channels in the apical membrane. So what does SGK1 do to NED42? So SGK1 is going to inhibit NED42. And the result of this inhibition is it basically decreases the ubiquination of the ENAC channels. And when we decrease the ubiquination, we basically decrease the amount of degradation that occurs. So the effect of SGK1 is to increase the number of ENAC channels present in the apical membrane. Another effect of SGK1 is it's going to modulate the activity of ROMK channels. So ROMK channels allow potassium to be secreted into the tubial lumen, and SGK1 will increase the activity of these channels, therefore allowing more secretion to take place. And the last effect of SGK1 is it's going to affect the activity of the sodium-potassium pump. SGK1 increases the activity of the sodium-potassium pump, which allows the pump to move more sodium from the cytosol into the interstitial fluid. It therefore allows the sodium-potassium pump to increase the sodium reabsorption that takes place. So, in summary, aldosterone increases the transcription and therefore the translation of SGK1. This does three things. SGK1 inhibits NED42, which decreases the ubiquination of ENAC channels. This allows more ENACs to stay in the apical membrane and therefore increasing the reabsorption of sodium. In addition, SGK1 increases the activity of ROMK channels. This increases the amount of potassium secretion into the tubule lumen. And lastly, SGK1 increases the activity of the sodium-potassium pump, allowing more sodium to move into the interstitial fluid. So this is how sodium reabsorption is increased in the collecting ducts through the action of aldosterone. The last thing that we're going to talk about is an important enzyme, called 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2. So this enzyme is extremely important in the collecting ducts of the nephron, and we're going to explain why now. So in the nephron, we can have cortisol that moves into the epithelial cells. So the cortisol will move into the epithelial cells through passive diffusion, and this is because cortisol is a derivative of cholesterol. So cortisol moves into the cell, However, when cortisol moves into the epithelial cells, in this case a principal cell in the collecting duct, what happens is, is cortisol is actually going to be converted into cortisone through the action of 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2, which is abbreviated as 11-beta-HSD2. Now, the importance of this action is that cortisol can actually bind to the glucocorticoid receptor and the mineral corticoid receptor. Cortisol has a very high affinity for these two receptors. Therefore, if cortisol is left on its own, cortisol can bind to the mineral corticoid receptor and have the same effects on the principal cells as aldosterone has. So by breaking cortisol into cortisone, what happens is, is cortisone has a much lower affinity to these receptors. It, therefore, this enzyme keeps cortisol from binding to the receptors. So aldosterone can bind to both of these receptors, and cortisol can bind to these both, both of these receptors. However, through the action of 11-beta-HSD2, cortisol is converted into cortisone, and cortisone has a very low affinity for these two receptors. So in summary, 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 catalyzes the conversion of cortisol into cortisone. And since cortisone has a very low affinity for the glucocorticoid receptor and the mineral corticoid receptor, this means that this enzyme keeps cortisol from binding to these receptors. 
So what would happen if this enzyme were inhibited? Well, one molecule that inhibits it is a specific acid, which is shown right here. And this acid is actually found in licorice. So when this acid inhibits this enzyme, what happens is, is the conversion from cortisol to cortisone is decreased. So in other words, cortisone production stops and cortisol remains in the cell. So what happens in this case? Well, when the cortisol comes into the cell, if this enzyme is inhibited, the cortisol is not being converted into cortisone. As a result, the cortisol will bind to the mineral corticoid receptor and to the glucocorticoid receptor. And as a result of this, when the cortisol binds to the mineral corticoid receptor, this will cause the same effects as aldosterone. So the result of inhibiting 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2 is that cortisol can now bind to the mineral corticoid receptor and increase sodium resorption in the collecting ducts, and this can cause hypertension. So that's it for this video. I hope it helped you understand how aldosterone works in the kidney, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.